Peter says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Charlie. Good evening, everybody. Um, short reading, not necessarily short talk. Um, the talk is, as, as Ian said, going to be recorded. Uh, this is uh, an important subject and there are uh, a number of things that I want to share um, and talk about this evening. So you may find that it's uh, one of those talks where it would be helpful to get hold of the recording yourself uh, so that you can um, listen back to it or to parts of it and just pick up anything from it that you want to uh, at a future date. Um, so please don't feel you've got to try and remember everything uh, that I say. Well, now what I'd like you to do is to imagine that you are relaxed, happy, feeling good. And then something happens. It could be anything. For example, you are asked to give a presentation in front of your peers at work or on your course at uni or in your class at school. You may respond by feeling excited at the prospect, galvanized into action to start preparing. You may, particularly as the day draws closer, feel a little nervous, even quite a bit nervous, but nervous in a way to stimulate you to give of your best. Or you may experience anxiety, a deep sense of not being in control of the outcome of something important, fearful that something you want to happen won't happen or that something you're afraid of happening will happen. Maybe you decline the invitation out of fear of what might happen. Or you may be so anxious that you can neither prepare properly in advance nor deliver properly on the day. And this happens over and over again, a hundred, a thousand times in all sorts of different circumstances. I have struggled with anxiety at various points in my life, including being on medication to control it. It was particularly acute when I was teaching. I had to teach religious philosophy to A-level students, complicated material that I had never covered before. And so I was really only a few pages ahead of my students in the textbook. I would regularly wake up at three or four o'clock in the morning and be quite unable to go back to sleep, lying there, waiting for the alarm to go off, working out strategies to avoid getting things wrong, being found out, making sure my preparation was 110% as thorough as it could possibly be. I tried all sorts of things to deal with my anxiety. I even thought of listening to my own sermons as a way to get to sleep. But still, three o'clock in the morning would come and I would be wide awake. Perhaps you can identify with me. Is there anything that we can do about it? Well, what I want to suggest tonight is that the antidote to anxiety is to be found in the truth about God, which itself is found in the word of God, what we call the Bible. I want to say that there is nothing more important and nothing more powerful than knowing the truth about God. The way we view God determines how we experience life. And ultimately, all the truths in the Bible which, with which to fight anxiety come down to two. And they are these. 
God is good and God is sovereign. God is good, loving, and God is sovereign, in control of all things. Knowing these two things is the way to fight anxiety. Which brings us to our text for this evening, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Don't worry if you haven't got a Bible, because I'm going to uh, be uh, repeating uh, some of the, the words in those verses uh, several times in the next few minutes. And the reason I've chosen this passage is because both of these truths about God are found here in this passage. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. This is the hand which created the universe. This is the hand which sustains the universe in being from one second to the next. God's mighty hand. God is sovereign, in control of all things and able to give us all we need. He can lift us up in due time. And then verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. Whoever you are, whatever you may have done in the past, he cares for you enough to send his son into the world to die for you. His care for you and everything about you in every circumstance is infinite. God is good. He wants to give you all you need. If we will involve him in our lives, he can and he will lift us up in due time. Armed with these two truths of the word of God, we can battle anxiety. Knowing these two things, we have no need to feel anxious. And yet, still, we feel anxious. Many of us know these things are true. We remind ourselves of them. We pray to God in the light of them. But still, we struggle with anxiety. Why? Why, when I try to do what scripture calls me to do, to cast my anxiety on God, why do I still feel anxious? I want to suggest that there are two reasons for this and to consider what we can do about each of them. The first reason we still feel anxious, I suggest, is because although we know the truth about God, deep down, beneath our conscious mind, we struggle to believe it. A man's son was once seriously ill. He begged Jesus to heal him. Jesus challenged him as to whether he truly believed. I do believe, he said. Help me overcome my unbelief. Although many of us know the truth about God, deep down, beneath our conscious mind, we struggle to believe it. We struggle to see God as good and sovereign in a way that will actually affect and make a real difference to how we experience life. For all sorts of reasons, many of them dating from long ago, in the deepest part of our being, we struggle to believe in God's power. Or, much more likely, we struggle to believe in God's goodness. 
or much more likely still, we struggle to believe in God's goodness to us. That God would really be interested enough in me, concerned enough for me to make things better for me. Which means that functionally, whatever we may believe with our rational minds, functionally, when it comes to dealing with life, we're pretty much on our own. And it's this which exposes us to anxiety. So how do we deal with this? This first reason why even as believers, we still feel anxious. We deal with it by realising that what we need more than anything else is to know the truth about God. That he is sovereign over every detail of our lives and that he is good and desires to do us only good. But we need to know these things at a level deeper than just our surface thinking and beliefs. How do we do that? How do we get to that deeper place? You need to listen carefully to this next point. The way to this deeper level of our being is through the mind. The way we think about God determines how we experience God and therefore how we experience life. But because this level of knowing God lies deeper than on the surface, it takes longer to get there. Which means we have to spend more time dwelling with the truths about God we find in the Bible slowing ourselves down, reading them over and again, reflecting on them, chewing on them, if you like, not swallowing them whole, enjoying them, thanking God for them, praying them in. It's what the Bible means by meditation, not emptying our minds, but filling our minds with the Bible's truths about God, slowly, richly, deeply. It takes time to reach this place. It can't be done in a five minute look at the Bible. If we won't make time, we will never reach that place. But it can be reached if we are prepared to spend deep time with God, learning to really own and enjoy the truths about him that he has shared with us. This is how God helps those who believe to conquer their unbelief. But before we go on to the second reason why we still feel anxious, there's another way of dealing with this, another way of engaging in the battle to believe what we believe. From the other end of the spectrum, if you like. And that is that every time we feel that electric shock, that falling sensation in our stomach, that tightening in the chest as anxiety kicks in, to remind ourselves of these two truths about God we so naturally don't believe. Every time we start to feel anxious, as soon as we notice we start to feel anxious. Let me give you an example of what I mean. This morning, as Ian was making the final point in his sermon, Roz took the notebook in which I was making notes as she had missed something that Ian said and wanted to see if I'd made a note of it. 
I was really wanting to write down what Ian was going on to say at that moment, as I thought it would be really useful in our discussion at Fellowship Group on Thursday. But Roz had my notebook. Immediately, I felt those familiar sensations. But then, probably because I'd been preparing this talk, I resisted them. I reminded myself of God's goodness. I reminded myself of God's sovereign control over every detail of my life, even my notebook. I told myself that he knew what I would need on Thursday, that he would be there on Thursday helping me as I led, that he would guide our conversation, that he would enable me to remember what I needed to remember, that it wasn't all down to me being as prepared as I possibly could be. And immediately, there and then, I felt the sweetest sensation of the nearness of God. His presence, his goodness. I felt my anxiety dissipate. I felt a calm come over me. I felt an excitement, a sense of anticipation and expectancy, wondering what God was going to do next Thursday, instead of worrying about whether I would be able to do it. Slow, deep reflection and immediate, repeated reminders. Two ways to fight the fight of faith, to battle to believe what we believe in the face of our anxiety. But there is a second reason why we still experience anxiety, even as believers. It's linked to the first reason, because it has to do with how we try to deal with life, given the fact that deep down we struggle to accept God's sovereignty and his goodness in a way that actually makes a difference to how we experience life. It's here in how we try to cope with giving that presentation at uni or at work or at school. It's here that the root causes of anxiety are to be found. And until we do something about these root causes, we won't make much progress in our battle against anxiety. There's a rather poor joke that can help us to get at what I'm saying. A couple are hopelessly lost in deepest, darkest Somerset. They stop their car by a field and they ask a farmer how to get to Bath. He just looks at them for a long time and then says, well, I wouldn't start from here. It's a rubbish joke, but I think the key to understanding why so often our efforts to do verse 7 to cast all our anxiety on God seem to make so little difference to our anxiety. We shouldn't start from here. You see, the point is that in the Greek, verse 7 is in the middle of a sentence. The sentence starts at verse 6 and is better translated. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This, verse 6, is where we should start. There's something we need to do before we cast our anxiety on God, and that is to humble ourselves before God. So if humbling ourselves before God is the key to casting our anxiety effectively upon God. If we must humble ourselves before we can cast our anxiety, how do we do that? What does it mean to humble ourselves before God? It means, first of all, identifying the root causes of our anxiety so that we can then address them. 
There are, of course, many causes of anxiety. But at root, there are three that are particularly significant. And most people who struggle with anxiety can relate to one or more of them. They are pride, insecurity and control. And before we can deal with them, we have to understand how they work. Pride. I have a high opinion of myself and I like it when other people share that opinion of me. And so I start to put pressure on myself. It's important that the presentation goes well so that quietly to myself, I can indulge my high opinion of myself and so that other people will then be impressed and tell me how well I've done. I will have that satisfying sense of knowing that other people admire me as I admire myself. Insecurity. I have a low opinion of myself. And so I need other people to have a high opinion of me in order to affirm me, to reassure me that I am in fact okay. For this to happen, it's essential that the presentation goes well. And so I start to put significant pressure on myself for it to be as good as it can possibly be. Fear of what will happen if it doesn't go well starts to grow within me the fear of not being any good, the fear of being exposed, being found out, the fear of other people knowing how rubbish I know myself to be. Actually, if we look more closely, we can see that insecurity is actually another form of pride. It is the other side of the same coin. Not so much the desire to be thought well of, which comes from pride, but the need to be thought well of, which comes from insecurity. And thirdly, control. I have a low opinion of myself. I need the presentation to go well so that other people will see me in a certain way and that I can then feel okay about myself. But for the presentation to go well, certain things must happen. I need to be well prepared. The sound system needs to work. The lighting needs to be right. The tech needs to work. The right people need to be there. But how do I control all of these things to ensure that everything goes as smoothly as it needs to? And so I start to put pressure on myself more and more pressure as I think of more and more ways in which things might go wrong, more and more things which I need to find a way of controlling. Pride is giving to ourselves the regard which only God deserves. The problem is that deep down, I know I don't deserve it. Insecurity is finding our identity, our need to be accepted in something other than Jesus. The problem is that if we find our sense of acceptance, our belief that we are OK in something other than Jesus, in our abilities, our achievements, the approval of other people, it will always be insecure. We will know the ever present fear of losing it. No matter how well I prepare my lessons, have I done enough? Can I keep doing enough tomorrow and the next day? We will constantly be anxious. Control is claiming for ourselves what is only God's to exercise. Once we refuse to accept that God is in control of his world, we are forced to seek to establish and maintain that control for ourselves. 
And the problem is that deep down, we know that unlike God, we are not sovereign. There is in fact really nothing which actually is under our control, which means we will constantly be anxious. Pride, insecurity, control. They are all expressions of our determination to be independent of God in our lives. Roots in the dark soil of our self-regard, drawing poisoned sap up into our souls and there producing the bitter fruit of anxiety. But what do we do about them? How do we humble ourselves beneath God's mighty hand? For each of us, this will be different. Perhaps we need to confess to God our pride, robbing God of the regard that is his. Perhaps we need to confess our determination to establish our own identity the way we want to, without reference to the God who made us, who loves us, and who wants to share our lives with us. Perhaps we need to confess our determination to control our lives, to raise ourselves up at a time that seems good to us, rather than to trust and submit to the loving direction of God in our lives. Perhaps we need to realise and to accept, not just at the surface of our thinking, but in that deeper place, that because God loves us, he is offering us a secure identity, an unshakable conviction that we are okay that we are acceptable and accepted, based not in anything we may or may not be able to do, based entirely in what Jesus has done for us to make us unchangingly acceptable to God. Perhaps we need to realise and to accept that our lives are in the mighty hand of the God who loves us, even when it is so hard to see how. Perhaps we need to do all of these things. But let me say this, and it is critically important that you hear this if you want to gain increasing victory over your anxiety. You will only ever be able to do battle with the root causes of anxiety in your life if you know, not just in your mind, but in that deeper place, in your heart, if you know as an unshakable certainty what Peter says next in verse seven, that God cares for you, that God loves you now, today, just as you are, prideful, insecure, controlling, looking anywhere but to God, God, loves you. He cares for you now. He is not waiting for you to sort these things out before he will love you. He loves you now. Only here in this truth, when it reaches your heart, will you find the power that will release you from the pride and insecurity and the need for control that fuel your anxiety 
that drive you to look for your sense of acceptance and well-being in all the wrong places and never in the one place that is right, in the God who cares for you. If we struggle to believe this, and I imagine that there isn't anyone here this evening who doesn't struggle to believe this in that deeper place that affects how we experience our lives. There is one verse in the Bible that we need to meditate on slowly, deeply, richly. And it is this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still committed to living independently of God, while we were still committed to having little, if anything, to do with God, to retaining control of our lives, to living our way, Christ died for us. God loves you now just as you are. I wouldn't start here. First humble, then cast. First humble yourself under God's mighty hand, then cast all your anxieties on him, knowing that he cares for you and trusting that because he cares for you, in his due time, he will lift you up. There's one more thing to say, because having said all this, it is still the case that you may find progress in your battle with anxiety frustratingly slow. And you may find that you are never entirely free of it in this life. Anxiety is a particularly stubborn weed. There are lots of reasons for this. Let me mention just two of which I think it's worth being aware. For most people who struggle with anxiety, their struggle has been a long one, perhaps even the struggle of a lifetime. The root tentacles of their anxiety are very well established indeed, beneath the soil, beneath the surface of their conscious living. Repeated instances of anxious responses to particular stimuli over a lifetime produce neural pathways in our brains that over the years become deeply established, triggered very easily by anxiety provoking moments. It is also the case that particularly extreme trauma can leave a residual anxiety, an echo of the incident itself, long, many years long, after the moment of the incident has passed. These reactions in the brain can take a long time to reprogram. God can and does change the nature of these pathways in the brain so that they produce a far less severe reaction when they are triggered or even do not prompt an anxious reaction at all anymore. He can and he may graciously do this instantly even or it may be his will that in you, this will be his work of years, perhaps even a lifetime, as he walks with you. But he will lift you up in his due time.
because he cares for you. Anxiety is a stubborn weed. For these and other physiological and psychological reasons, it is not as simple as saying that if we confess our pride, our self-reliance and our lack of trust, if we focus on the truth that the sovereign God cares for us, our anxiety will then be gone. It's not as simple as that. It will be gone, gone forever one day, when we see him face to face. Until then, he promises to be with us every day and to walk with us in our struggles. However, perhaps this illustration as we close may help when we find our battle with anxiety is long and continuing and hard. Think of someone who has suffered a terrible car crash and needs to learn to walk again. The physiotherapy, the muscle building exercises, the agonizingly slow progress, trying to make their legs move again whilst holding on to those two parallel bars. No matter how slow the progress, this is the road to recovery. This is the way to walk again, even run again. In the same way, even if our battle with anxiety is long and progress slow, this is the way to fight the battle. To acknowledge the root causes of our anxiety. To bring them honestly to God before we bring our anxieties to him. First humble, then cast. And then to fight our unbelief, battle to believe what we believe, slowly and deeply, momentarily and repeatedly, with the specific trust-building, anxiety-busting promises of our good and sovereign God who cares for us and who in due time will lift us up. I'm going to pause and keep a moment of quiet, just a few brief seconds really, for our own reflection. And then we're going to sing again. And after that, to close, I'd like to share with you just a couple of these trust building, peace promoting promises of God to show you how we can use them to battle our unbelief, to diminish, even defeat our anxiety. Let's keep a moment of quiet 